Hello, and welcome to Forget What You Learned, a place for families to stop and reflect on the modern state of education. We empower you to challenge your own thinking about today's traditional school system and ask the question, are my kids thriving? I'm Corey Greenberg, a parent in the trenches just like you, and I chat with innovators, experts, and other parents who are changing the conversation, inspiring families to reevaluate how we define academic success. This podcast is brought to you by Pacific Preparatory and Tutor Corps, sister organizations molding education through innovative one-on-one learning for students in today's digital world. In today's episode, I talk with Ann Boswell, the admissions director for a small school in the San Francisco Bay Area, serving students with dyslexia and twice exceptionality. Athena Academy has a unique formula that combines a cutting edge research-based approach to dyslexia education with project-based learning. A buzzword you've probably heard, but could use a little dissection. What is it really? And why does it work so well to empower students to love learning, especially when combined with Athena's multi-age classroom and truly individualized approach? Anne is so knowledgeable about the challenges all our students are facing within the traditional system and shares some ideas of how large public districts can actually implement what they're doing on a much smaller scale. Don't miss our engaging conversation. Well, hello and welcome to the podcast. Joining me today is Anne Boswell, who is the admissions director for a really innovative school in San Francisco for kids with dyslexia. It's called Athena Academy. Anne has been there since its inception in 2010 after serving as a dean of students at Stanford and pursuing her master's degree in education administration and counseling. She's going to talk about Athena's approach to education that works so well for kids with learning differences, but really could and should be applied to all students. As the mother of two twice exceptional sons, Anne has a unique perspective about what works and what really doesn't. Thanks for joining me today, Anne. Oh, thanks for having me, Corey. Uh, You and I met through a networking group that Pacific Prep has put together, and we were just in a breakout room talking about all the ways that our traditional system really needs a seismic shift. And how Athena operates, in my opinion, could really be a model for not only other independent schools, but could hopefully someday be replicated for every kid in the United States. So could you start by talking a a little bit about Athena's approach and just what do you all do that is really so inspiring to students? Yeah, yeah. I think it'd be a dream to have, you know, this model everywhere because while we focus on dyslexia education, really it's that hands-on approach and the way that we do things is helpful for all students. So I will I will dream that dream alongside of you. Um, we are a small private school in Palo Alto, California, like you said, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, really what we're trying to do is tailor the education that we're delivering to our students based on their individual needs. So we have um, small class sizes, six to seven students in the elementary school, Uh, about eight to 10 in the middle school. And all of our classes are multi-age and our students change classes throughout the day. So we're able to really keep them in that sweet spot of learning for their particular learning profile. So oftentimes we will see a student who comes in is maybe an age-based third grader, but they're reading at first or second grade levels, but they're doing math at fourth or fifth grade levels. And so by being able to cluster them with other students that are learning at that same level, we're really keeping them with their peers that can learn at a speed and a pace and and at the right level and being able to um, ask our teachers to teach to that specific level rather than maybe handing a teacher 20 of the same age-based students, but they're learning all over the place. And so both for our teachers, it's really um, helpful to zero in uh, on the level that they're teaching and be able to move those students along at the same pace, but also for our students, not holding them back in areas that they excel in and can really um, grow and thrive and and build that confidence in areas that they uh, are more advanced in, but also provide that additional support where they need it when they need it throughout the day. Um, And so what it really 
does for our students is build the confidence in the way that they learn. And we're also really pulling from various approaches based on the student that's sitting in front of us. So it's not a one size fits all model. We're able to look at what works for a particular student and continue to do that. We um, trial and error a lot of approaches with our students and are able to put together a package, an educational package for these students throughout the day and their years with us that really um, is based off of their specific learning profile. It's it's amazing. Um, I mean, so much of what you said just gives me goosebumps because from everything that I have learned through this process of, you know, just learning about non-traditional schools, everything you said seems to hit the mark in terms of what each individual student needs, which is to access the learning where they are, as opposed to the artificial grouping by age that our traditional system ha just falls back on because it's the most convenient and it makes the most sense on this bigger scale, but it doesn't really get at, you know, again, each seeing each student as their own, their own human, first of all, with different needs and just kind of, especially for kids with dyslexia, you know, it's a very, um, I guess, research forward approach that you're using, right? So let's talk about that first a little bit. Um, you know, not all of the listeners we have will have kids with dyslexia, but it's very important to understand that, you know, it is actually more common than we think. And there's, there's really innovative ways that you all are, you know, getting them to access their, their learning. Is that right? Yeah, we're just looking at various approaches. And so one of the things that we know about our students is that they come to us after being exposed to um, one or more very specific approaches that they've really done a deep dive into. Our younger students, not so much, but a lot of our older students, third grade on, have been told year after year, oh, it's okay, everybody catches up, everybody learns at a different speed, here, let's keep giving them the same of this thing, and we'll give them more of maybe what's not working. And so what we're trying to do is really use a lot of um, what we're learning in the, the more recent neuroscience research that's coming out of some of our big institutions that are looking at the brain and doing functional MRIs and understanding that some of these visual spatial thinking students do better when you present it in a different way, when you go in through the right side of the brain. And so that's a lot of what we're trying to do. And oftentimes it's trial and error. What works for one student sitting in a class isn't going to work exactly the same way. And so, um, that's pretty universal, right? I mean, that I think about growing up and, and my friends and being in school, and we all learned very differently. I had a friend who had a photographic memory that could look at one sheet of paper for 45 seconds and be able to tell you exactly what was on that piece of paper. And I had another friend who that completely put them into a tailspin and had to hear it auditorily. And so these this isn't unique to our dyslexic population, but it's being able to think outside the box and to really know that one model, one approach, one curriculum, one textbook isn't always going to be the answer for everybody. And that's hard to do when you have larger class sizes. It's hard to do in large districts and large schools where obviously finances are prohibitive or you're buying a textbook to use for the next 10 years and you have to be able to figure out how to use that universally. But, you know, we've got these really talented teachers in our country that, that figure out how to mold that or figure out how to cluster kids. And it can be done in some of these more traditional, um, larger environments, but I think it takes a really willing teacher and and with a lot of creativity and I think it takes um, frankly some some reevaluation on this idea of standardized testing and how much time and energy that's taking up in a lot of our public schools right now and that's a whole other podcast but um, yep. I think we have this great luxury of being able to mold this curriculum and pull things in there are new things being introduced all of the time. Education is constantly changing. And so being able to be really nimble and to go out and find these things and test them out on our students and see what's working and not working, and then be able to universally introduce that into the entire school is um, really, it's a great privilege, but it's a luxury to be able to do that. And, and we get that. 
Yes, I I totally agree with you. And sometimes, you know, I think all of us sort of go down that rabbit hole of despair and thinking like when I when I find, you know, something like Athena or another school we we talked to, Qualia, where it seems like this utopia, the question really looms like, what about the masses and the people who can't afford private school tuition or they just don't have an option where they live, you know, for something like this, you know? So it, I love hearing you talk about how this really could actually be adopted or, you know, worked on in a larger setting. I mean, to me, the idea of grouping kids by ability or the way they learn, I mean, is that the first step? Because that to me sounds like the most logical place to start is like, we, we need to do away with the artificial groupings by age, but it's really about like how kids learn and starting with that. So I think it's a little bit of both, really. I mean, what what we're what we have the ability to do is see a student's learning profile through their neuropsych testing, and most kids don't go through that process. If you think even the dyslex a lot of our dyslexic kids who are undiagnosed do not go through that process. So there's a lot of information in there that we can tease out and be able to make a hypothesis on what's going to work for that student based on the information that we received through the admissions process. So it's, we're in a, a different position than I think a larger school or a larger district is in. But I, I do think teachers can navigate that and they can think through and really experience and pay attention to their students and how they take that information in and possibly be able to group kids based on that, right? We know our kids are visual spatial thinkers. We know if we deliver information in a visual way, they're more apt to understand it. They're more apt to remember it. There are those kids in a larger traditional classroom, but there are also those auditory learners as well. And that would be really interesting to see if a school experimented in that way and delivered that content in the way that the student learned best. But I think it's twofold with the multi-age classes as well. And a lot of schools have multi-age classes, but they're doing that mostly to bridge enrollment numbers and to look at like, well, we only have half of a third grade class and half of a second grade class. So let's um, sort of blend those together and, and create a third classroom instead of looking at it in the sense of, and, and oftentimes that blending still happens from a birth date perspective, from a maturity perspective, instead of an academic perspective. And what we're really looking at is what level is this student working on in language arts? Great, let's cluster them in language arts with those students. What level is the student working on in math? Great, let's cluster them that way. And so it's, it looks a lot like a high school schedule, um, you know, fewer transitions and, and fewer movements, but we're able to really um, keep those students there. And so the teacher isn't all over the place. They aren't trying to um, teach to the middle and hope everybody comes along for the ride or doesn't get bored. And I think that engagement is really critical as well, because a lot of times if something is over a student's head or it's being delivered too quickly, um, a lot of our students are brilliant. I mean, our, our kids are so smart. Dyslexic students really do change the world. They just have to get through this K through 12 education model that, that isn't really catered to them. Yeah. And so they have all of that talent. They have all of that brain power. Um, but when they're being taught at a speed that is too fast for their processing speed, which is oftentimes um, comes up a little bit slower than a neurotypical student, or they aren't given the tools to be able to help with their working memory, they will just shut down. They think they can't do it. They think they can't understand it. And when you can slow things down or use assistive technology or um, introduce tools and strategies to a student that are very tailored to who they are, it makes a huge difference in their confidence and their ability to see that they can do it. And when you're looking at a classroom with I say 20, but that's on the low side, right? You're looking at 25 or 30 kids and the teacher really has to decide, am I teaching to the top, the middle or the bottom? And two thirds usually of those kids have to navigate that space in a way that isn't ideal for them. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes to all of that. I'm just nodding yeah. along with you. Well, and so 
in in terms of the multi age setup, like what do you do as far as their social emotional well being and and also navigating, you know, like it, well, okay, first of all, let me ask you on a detailed level, what's the widest like age range that you might have in a classroom? Are we talking about like a third grader with a sixth grader, or what? What's typically like the largest spread there? Yeah, so we si- we start first grade and we mm-hmm. go through eighth grade, and we silo based on the elementary school and the middle school. So our elementary okay. school is first through fifth. Our middle school is sixth through eighth. So we really do keep those students separate from one another. Um, Mm -hmm. There is nothing more damaging to a self-esteem to put an eighth grader into a first grade language arts class with first and second graders. So um, we will assist those students in other ways if they are working uh, way below grade level. We have different resource push and pull out um, capabilities with our students, but we really are looking at that first through fifth and that sixth through eight uh, clustering. And, uh, you know, it depends year to year. It depends on our student population. We have had classes that have had four, a four grade span, not very often. We've had classes that have had all say fifth graders in a math class doing seventh grade math. So mm-hmm. it's not as though we're opposed to keeping all of the birth year grade level together. It really just depends on who, who we're working with that year and how can we um, partner them in ways that everybody's going to have the most success, including the teacher. And so it really fluctuates, but we're thoughtful about that piece that can also play into the self-esteem and the social emotional learning. Yeah, exactly. And and it's kind of like the Montessori method in that, you know, there are gifts within that multi-age, you know, classroom that you wouldn't necessarily think of. I mean, the older mentoring and teaching the younger, the younger really looking up to and learning from the older, um, you know, my kids went through Montessori in the primary years. And I just remember feeling very lucky that that they got that experience because in and going from being the youngest to then being the oldest like there's some growth there that again you don't necessarily get when you're with all of your same age peers all the time yeah and you know we're small so we have um generally between i'd say we average about 65 students 65 to 70 students a year And, you know, first grade, a lot of our kids aren't identified yet. So we don't have as many Mm -hmm. first graders as we have, say, fifth or sixth graders. But they all know each other. They do their, they take their lunch together. They have their recesses together. Um, A lot of the social interactions that are happening on campus are done by interest. So we have our sporty kids that find each other. And it is not unusual to find these kids a first grader and an eighth grader and everything in between playing a soccer match on the field. And it's, that's very much the norm and not unusual at all. And so when our kids go through these classes and they're rotating through their classes, they get to know a lot of different kids because they're placed differently in language arts as they are in in math and then social studies and science. We do um, a, a different class placement. And so there's a lot of socializing, a lot of interaction, a lot of support, a lot of mentoring. Um, it's just a really sweet kind of nice community that allows our kids to have these different age relationships and friendships and be able to cultivate that in ways that I think you don't see in a more traditional school where students are in the same class all day long with the same teacher. And so, um, And there's a lot of camaraderie around that dyslexia piece, too, because Mm -hmm. these students are used to being other, right? They're in another environment, and they're the the one that can't do the work, or they're the one that um, gets pulled out, or they're the one in worst-case scenarios, schools that keep them in for recess to finish their work, which is the worst possible thing they could do, but it happens. So they're they're left out in ways that are, are different depending on their circumstances. And then they come here and the dyslexia just melts away, right? It's a, it's a non-issue. They're like, oh, you have dyslexia, I have dyslexia. Oh, you do too. And it becomes this very normalized experience that they don't think about much when they're here in the way that they had to think about and really protect themselves or navigate in their school previous to coming to Athena. Yeah. And you, you also talk about, you know, operating from a strengths-based perspective, which is what I just heard you say is that, you know, dyslexia is not a deficit. It's just a, a different way that the, that your brain works to process information. So I'm sure that's, so critical to these kids' self-esteem and their, like you said, their confidence and is going to carry them through 
you know, surviving the K-12 journey, but then into yeah. adulthood also. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that, so I don't think I've mentioned it yet, but we are a project-based curriculum and a lot of that is very strength-based. So our students get to bring their strengths to the table. They get to be excited about what they're learning. Um, they have an overarching or driving question that is presented for each project, but they really get to take it in a direction that engages them in ways that a worksheet or rote memorization doesn't. And so that's another big piece of it too, is they get very um, invested in what they're working on. They get very invested in the project, in the learning in ways that isn't so much about the outcome of a score on a spelling test or a worksheet that you can turn in first for a prize or, you know, all these things that just simply don't work for our students and the way that their brains function. And so showing them that there's a different way to do this as well and a different way to engage their brain and to build that confidence is, is really important. So, okay, can you break down really what is project-based learning? Because I think that's one of those buzzwords that, you know, parents have heard of, but the question is like, what is it really? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, that would take a whole other podcast. <laughs> And I definitely have colleagues that I would send to you to, to really <laughs> tackle that in great depth. But I think a lot of times when parents think about project-based learning or you say project-based learning, they say, oh, my school does that. My kid did a diorama last week. Or my school did that. They had uh, a science fair project that they did. And true project-based learning is really driven by uh, an overarching or a broad question, like I mentioned before. And so it could be... Um, Gosh, I um, obviously now just drew a complete blank on every single project-based question that's ever been asked. At, at yes, it happens. Like, it happens. Um, so one of the ones that I think about is there's there was one that I love that was where is the art in, uh, where is the math in art? And hmm. we had students, that's just what they started with. There was no, the teacher had no expectation where that was going, put it out to the class and they took it and ran with it. And what they ended up doing was creating a harmonograph, which is um, for people my age, it's sort of like a built, uh, like a life-size um, spiral graph. You know, those like spiral, um, I can't remember what they were called. Shoot. Anyway, you put your pin in and, and you would follow. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And so they created this from scratch and they um, developed a model and they kind of built, ended up building it to scale in our maker space. And it had pendulums on it. I wish I had a picture. It's amazing. I haven't let them take it down. It, it, they <laughs> built it before COVID and it's still sitting on our maker space because it's incredible. Wow. And when you change the weight and you change the angle of the pen, it changes the art that that device can make. And so it really is the students doing algebraic equations over and over and over, but they have no idea because they weren't handed a worksheet and said 240 of these. They were handed a question that essentially they got to then drive the project to be able to answer that question. So it's really looking at um, showing the depth of a student's learning instead of the breadth of their learning. We're not mm -hmm. looking at memorizing. We're looking at students being able to take things in their own way and to really look at the project-based cycle, which, um, you know, it's not a line. It does this sort of infinity curve where they're looking at planning their project. They have to reflect on that project. They make edits and changes to that project. And what that does both is allow them to get creative and to really use a lot of that creative strength that they have and take a question or an idea or a concept or a subject in a direction that they're really excited about, but it also is helping them with their executive functioning skills because mm -hmm. they're having to reflect, they're having to stop, they're having to think about what supplies do I need? I mean, there's a lot of planning that goes into this and um, our teacher in that particular project made one trip to Home Depot. So they went over that supply list, they did their calculations, they figured out how those measurements needed to be made to actually build this device. And then they were able to also dig deeper and, and change the weight on it and change the angle on it. And so it was just this layer and layer of learning in ways that does not exist in a traditional um, classroom or something where there's just this right answer and this wrong answer. There is really no right answer or wrong answer. It's 
what are you learning along the way and and how can we um be more creative in that learning and our students they will never forget that project they will never forget what they learned they will never forget when it failed one time because they too, put too much weight on it and they realized they had calculated it wrong and they were able to make that adjustment whereas a lot of the memorization a lot of that this is right, this is wrong, black and white is just lost immediately after an exam or immediately after um, cramming it in and then going on to the next subject. Yeah. And what you just said about it, it's it's the depth of the learning instead of the breadth, like it's also teaching them critical thinking and problem solving, Absolutely. which is not a tangible you know, it's not outcome based. Another mm -hmm. term that you mentioned earlier, that is one that I've been thinking about a lot in our traditional system, everything is outcome based. And it's all about those standardized tests, because you can measure it. And you can you can evaluate, is the school really, you know, teaching our kids, whatever, whatever the system has decided, they all have to learn. It's just the easiest and most convenient way to evaluate that. But what you're describing there isn't really a tangible way for you to prove to the powers that be that you have like, you know, given your kids the skills that they need, but it's so obvious, right? That, that these yeah. are the skills that they need, but how do we reconcile that piece of like, we can't prove that, that the project-based learning or that is really what our kids need? Well, I'm sure there's probably some research, research out there um, that, that we could pull up that they're they're doing because there are a lot of schools that are starting to move to that model and i know that um there are organizations that really champion project-based learning um i'm certainly not an expert in it and so i would hate to leave lead people astray but i i think that you know it's project-based learning is hard because it's mm -hmm. it's not you're not handing over a textbook to a teacher they have to be highly trained in it they have to be willing to be creative and and do things differently and get messy and it can be expensive because you're buying consumables for a student to be able to build a project and so there are some limitations to it and i think um like you said one of the hardest parts is communicating what is actually being taught and what the student is learning and because there isn't a worksheet going home there isn't a folder on fridays going home with like this is everything your child did in class yeah. and we do try to host open houses for our parents to come in and see that end project but they oftentimes don't see maybe that a student finished it in three days and was like oh wow i, I think i was a little too short-sighted in this i should probably expand this or they don't see that in the six-week cycle the student only got halfway through what they wanted to do because they bit off more than they could chew or they elaborated too much on whatever it was and it just wasn't doable but that's all a huge part of the learning process and so much of what allows our students to grow with project-based learning are those failures if you will right i mean these kids are so afraid to fail because it's what their experience has been in school up to this point is not being enough or being told they have to be pulled out because they aren't keeping up with the class and so they're really afraid to fail. And this gives them a chance to do it in a way that they're supposed to fail. You're supposed to get it wrong so that you can then reevaluate and rebuild. And that's, that's life, right? So it's building the resiliency. It's building their executive functioning skills. It's building their ability to go out on a limb and take a risk. And we see it when they're here year after year, you see these kids jump into the deep end of the pool on a project that they never would have done two or three years before because they've built that confidence. They've been able to know that it's okay if it doesn't happen or it doesn't turn out the first time that they're going to work with their teacher to adjust that. And really you nailed it. It's really skill-based, right? We're not looking at, can you memorize all of these facts about 18th century European history, right? Like it's, it's not yeah. about that. It's, it's really about digging in and um, experiencing the learning in a way that is um, memorable and sticks with our kids and teaches them all of these life skills and, and critical thinking and learning and problem solving and all of those pieces you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're raising kids to be adults who, yeah. you know, <laughs> have to be in the workforce and, you know, memorizing yeah. the 18th century, you know, European 
art facts is not necessarily going to help them in the job search, you know? Right, but, right. Or yeah. in their job, right? Yeah. I mean, when's in the last time yeah. someone gave you a test at your job, right? It just doesn't, exactly. it doesn't exist beyond this bubble of, of education. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just magic. Um, you know, every time, every time I hear about schools like Athena, I just think, you know, in, in a perfect world, every kid would have access to what they specifically needed to, like you said, survive the K-12 experience, but thrive, yeah. you know, and, and really kind of ha set them up for success as an adult. Cause we, yeah. yeah. Okay. We well, dream. on that note, we can dream. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, on that note, let's go through the lightning round. Okay. So, um, get ready. Uh, I'm ready. first question. Good. First question is what's your favorite education or parenting book? So I know I'm only supposed to pick one, but I'm going to give you two. Um, okay. Let's both, hear it. They're both gems. The first one is self reg by Stuart, uh, Shanker. Okay. And the second one, um, I hope I get this title right. It's a long one. The Essential Guide to Raising Complex Kids with ADHD, Anxiety, and More. Um, and I have so much to say about both of those, but I know I'm not supposed to say more. So, okay. Oh my gosh. Well, that's that's quite the the teaser. So I will put those. <laughs> we will put those in the show notes for everyone yeah. to check out, and I will put them great. on my list too. And now I have a really long list of books that I need to read. So I bet sounds I bet. great. Um, okay. Second question: What do you do in your free time, man? Um. I don't have a ton of it. I have two yeah, kids, um, but I love I love to travel, and and oddly enough, um, I love to organize things. That's like it, oh. it's very zen. Brings me a lot of joy and, and and makes me zenful when I when I can organize things. I love that. Well, you have an open invitation to come down here to Houston and organize my house. Oh, it's, it's I'll not. make you get rid of things. So that's that's good. <laughs> it is very cathartic. I love that. Yeah. Um, okay. Number three is in one word, what do you think that kids today need more of? Nature. Oh, I love that. They do. They do need nature. Um, okay. Number four, what's your favorite like feel good song? Jesse's Girl by Rick Springfield. Oh, I love that one too. <laughs> I love that one too. Um, and number five, last question. If you could summon anything to your desk, like with a magic button, what would it be? An around the world plane ticket. Ooh, good one. Good one. Mm -hmm. You didn't say the, you know, like wishing for more wishes kind of thing. So I like that. No, really I answer. think second place would be uh, uh, Tiki Masala from Zarine's, which is a restaurant here in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. So that that seems more reasonable that something I would do at my desk, but I'll take the I'll take the plane ticket too. love it. Love it. <laughs> Well, and this was such a lovely conversation, uh, really thought provoking on so many levels. I'm, and like I said, I love what you all are doing at, at Athena and, um, I don't know, just keep on fighting the good fight for us out there. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. And I feel like I could talk about this for hours. So, um, I look forward to hanging out again sometime soon and, and continuing the conversation. Love it. Thanks for joining me today. All right. Thanks, Corey. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forget What You Learned, hosted by me, Corey Greenberg. As always, our goal is to allow you to zoom out on the snapshot of your family's life and answer the question, are my kids thriving? We're here to inspire you to make those small and maybe big changes to answer yes. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Pacific Preparatory and Tutor Corps sister organizations committed to educating students with an innovative and holistic approach in today's digital world. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a rating and review. See you next time.